We are so fortunate to have as our guest speaker today, and I am so excited to have the opportunity to introduce him to you. Rabbi Katz comes to us from Congregation Bethel in Tyler, Texas, where he is the eighth full-time rabbi there since it began in 1887. Rabbi Katz is the recipient of numerous awards and accolades for social justice, community service, and interfaith work. He sits on many boards of charitable and civic organizations, has taught Introduction to Judaism courses at Tyler Junior College, and currently teaches that course at UT Tyler. His list of community activities, board memberships, awards, and recognitions, and his professional organizational memberships and involvement go on and on. A lot more information about him can be found on the Congregation Bethel website. I know we are looking forward to his message to us. Good morning. Good morning. So I am the rabbi in Tyler, Texas, a couple hours from here. And can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, good. And uh, I jokingly tell people that I am on the Unitarian circuit. <laughs> so I routinely go to UU Longview, UU Tyler, and UU Lufkin, those three over in East Texas. But I've also go probably once a year to UU in Huntsville. And I've been to, I've been to the one in Dallas as well. So. For 20 years that I've been in Tyler, I feel like I said I'm on the circuit, and it's all good. But more importantly than any of that is one person in Tyler, uh, Mary Andrews, whose sister, Ina, uh, was our connection to UU Plano. And so I know for a few years there's been this desire to have me come out here, but I'm usually not free on Sundays because I'm teaching, but this particular Sunday worked. So I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Uh, Ina's sister Mary and I spent a decade working on a project called Art of Peace. It was a peace celebration anchored around the UN International Day of Peace on September 21st every year. Uh, and so we did a week-long series of projects. There were concerts and peace meals and art events and poetry anthologies and anything that our hippie minds could figure out. Uh, <laughs> we, we did for a week every year, myself, Mary Andrews, and our friend Ann McCready, who's another great speaker. Um, but also love this area. My son just graduated UT Dallas uh, in May, and so he, thank you. That's not the clap. The clap is that he got a job. That's the clap, right? He actually got a great job. He, he's, uh, he had a great experience at UT Dallas, and then he's now in Austin with his girlfriend, but he's working in computer science. That's that world. So uh, he, uh, he's in Austin. My middle daughter, my, my second kid, is also in Austin. She's at UT there in her junior year. And then my youngest, my 17-year-old, who uh, two weeks will be 18, uh, she's actually spending fall semester of her senior year of high school in Israel. So I dropped her off at, I dropped her off in New York last week, two weeks ago, I don't remember. And then she's there for four months. So we're empty nesters for the first time, my wife and I. And then she comes back in December and finishes up high school. Uh, and then she's most likely gonna be in Austin. So I'll have all three kids in Austin, but I kinda of would rather be in the Dallas area because it's two hours away, uh, <laughs> as opposed to four. Uh, this morning, I'm going to share with you uh, one of my favorite stories in Jewish tradition, but I want to give a little disclaimer first, which is, uh, I, as I said, I, I feel like over 20 years, I have a, a, a file in my computer called UU Topics, and they're, and they're things that I've, the topics that I've spoken about at different communities that I've gone to, so I don't repeat myself. Of course, you know, my guilt of repeating myself every 12, 12 years doesn't, doesn't land the same, you know, like, I don't remember that at all. But uh, I feel like if I meet a new community, I start with 101. You know, it's kind of, this is Judaism, and here's some questions and answers and kind of basics, and it's really fun. And then maybe on the second visit, I'll get into something a little bit deeper. And by the fifth or sixth or tenth visit, which is quite often what happens, we get into what we're getting to today. So I'm, the disclaimer is that we're starting in a deep dive, right? Um, because So there's a lot that I'm presuming you know, but I will explain it along the way, um, and hopefully this will make sense to you. Uh, the topic is called, so I'm jumping right in is what it boils down to. The topic is, um, the Torah is not in heaven. That'll make sense later. First thing I want to do is talk to you about the timeline. There's our fake year zero there in the purple in the middle. Uh, 
that purple line from 200-ish before the zero, that's my dating, that's not, a, that's not 100% accurate, but it's close enough, to the year 500, which is accurate on the other side. So when Christians use BC before Christ and AD, we use BCE before the Common Era and CE. Doesn't matter. Roughly in that 700 year span of time, from 200-ish before to 500 after, we have what's called the Rabbinic Revolution. The original rabbis were Pharisees, which I know in Christian terms has a connotation, but that's not, it doesn't in Judaism, but we don't really use that term anymore. It just means it was a break off sect in the second temple period. So that meant that there was a building up the hill in Jerusalem, uh, the temple, and there was a, the people who ran it, and then there were people kind of down the hill from it who were a little more um, interested in text study and spiritual development rather than cutting open goats up on the mountain, right? That, I, I'm covering, I'm glossing over a lot of stuff right now, but there, there were divisions in the Second Temple period that got stronger and stronger and stronger. The key moment comes in the year 70 when the temple is destroyed. So when the temple is destroyed by the Romans, by the way, if, you're, if you like the timelines, in the year 30, just go 40 years back, that would be Jesus for those who are interested, right? So we're talking about that temple, that community, that area. But in the year 70, the temple was destroyed. Israel was destroyed. Jews were exiled. They went out to the coast. They went to the north. They went and visited their cousins who were already in modern day Iraq and Iran from the first exile. And so Jews start to disperse and we don't come back to the land. Uh, we were always in the land, but we don't have sovereignty there until 1948. Different, different sermon, different sermon. <laughs> All I want us to do is focus on what happened during that 700 year period of time is uh, there's this factionalization of Jews in the late second temple period. It's not that exciting or interesting. What matters to us is that in the year 70, when the temple is destroyed, all those denominations, those factions go away, except one. This, if you've ever heard these words before, the Sadducees, they die out with the temple sect. The Zealots, they die out with the temple sect. Those who ran to Masada, gone in the year 73. Uh, the ones who were, went out to the Dead Sea and became hippies and uh, were called the Essenes or the Dead Sea sect, we never hear from them again, although we found their scrolls, the Dead Sea scrolls. The only group that really matters then is the rabbinic Jews. This is, I tell this to all my students, please don't think that on Monday the temple was destroyed and on Tuesday there was a community vote that we should all become rabbinic Jews. <laughs> there was a long, slow burn process by which they engaged text and ultimately, and this is the goal, this is what I want to impart today, ultimately claimed for themselves the right to be the authority and the authoritative voice of Judaism moving forward. Right? That's the, what happens in the year 70, there's kind of a, la a vacuum of leadership, but there was already this pre-established group, the rabbis, who were doing something like sitting around a conference table, debating points of law, coming up with uh, explanations for biblical inconsistencies or questions, and who gave them the right to do that? To which the answer is, they gave themselves the right to do that. Ah. Right. So what I want to share with you is, uh, there's just a couple quick pictures. There's a word there at the very end called Talmud. If anybody's ever heard of it, I'm going to show you just a page of Talmud. We're not studying it. We're going to study a text of Talmud today, but I'm just going to show you. Talmud looks like this. It's very confusing looking, but all that matters is this middle block here. That is technically Talmud. So the Talmud is, and I'll go back a couple slides. So can you see where it says 200? It says Mishnah. So Mishnah was the first book that, so imagine... For a few hundred years, there had been conversations. Well, what about this point of law? What about that point of law? What about this story? What about that? A guy comes along and he writes it down and puts it into one book. That's the Mishnah. And there was then 300 years of commentary on the Mishnah. So the Mishnah is a commentary on the Bible. This, then there's a commentary on top of that. Collectively, they're called the Talmud. And that's this page here. You all are going to become experts when this is done. <laughs> that, that middle block and that middle block only is two things. It's a little, maybe 10 or 12 lines of Mishnah that was finished in the year 200, and then maybe 100 lines of commentary text. And it goes page after page. I'll give you an example. On my library in, at the temple, I have a book called the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament, we call the Hebrew Bible. So uh, I have got the Hebrew Bible, it's a compilation of 39 canonized books, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, you all know. Uh, but I also have on my shelf 72 volumes of Talmud. It's, it's, it's a much more expansive work because it took hundreds of years to compile. Okay. Uh, again, I think 
the side stuff you don't need to worry about. That's just later commentary to the commentary of the commentary. Okay? <laughs> but by the way, if you ever watch on Netflix, if you watch like a, a show of Orthodox Jews who are hovering over a book and they're reading, they're not reading the Bible, they're reading this. This is what they study, and the tradition is you study one page per day, and it takes seven and a half years to go through. And there was a brand new cycle reading in January of 21, and a lot of people started because it was COVID, and they're like, you know what? I'm going to start doing what's called the page per day. Okay, so that's Talmud, and we're going to read a little selection from Talmud, uh, because I'm trying to answer this question post-70, after the Temple of Destruction, who is in charge? So I'm going to share with you a text that's kind of with a blue ribbon top of the top of the list of important texts of rabbinic literature that comes from the Mishnah. And it, it, th this will make sense in a moment. So the rabbis are talking amongst themselves and then they make this comment. They go, Moses, hopefully you know who Moses is. He receives the Torah at Sinai. He gives it to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, prophets to the men of the great assembly. Forget the gendering here. This is old text, right? And we'll get to the bottom part in a second. So let's just talk about what this is. This is, and, and please understand, I'm, I'm trying to answer the question, who's giving the rabbis the legitimacy to run Judaism at this point? They gave it to themselves. Look, Moses, God gives the Torah to Moses at Sinai. Not a Jew on the planet disagrees with that. I mean, we may talk about whether it was God or whether it was written. We could, a separate sermon is who wrote the Bible, right? I don't believe that, I don't believe that anything dropped on Moses' head at Sinai. I'm more in the Mel Brooks line, right? I give to you these 15, 10, 10 commandments, right? That joke. But euphemistically, law comes from that moment at Sinai and through Moses. And then we all know, because the text tells us, that it, Joshua is the next one in charge of Judaism. And we know that Joshua passes that on to the wider community of the elders. The elders then give it on to the prophets. Again, no one's disagreeing. And then conspicuously jumping all the priests running the temple business for a thousand years, they give it then to us, the men of the great assembly, us, the people who are running and writing this text. In other words, it isn't that uh, it's partly that we claim it for ourselves, but it's also because uh, we, we said we are the next in the line. By the way, if I was to write this, I'd say Moses to Sinai, uh, I'm sorry, Moses to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, elders to the prophets, prophets to the men of the great assembly, men of the great assembly to kneel. Sure, right? Why not? Then I get to justify why I'm in charge. And they created a few little rules at the end. Be patient. Take your time. Hundreds of years to get the mission of the Talmud put together. Uh, Make a lot of students and make a siag la Torah. I could do a whole separate sermon. A, a fence around the Torah means if there's a point of law in the Torah, do not murder, right? One of the Ten Commandments. Okay, that sounds good, but we now have to have a massive community discussion as to what it means not to murder, right? Because there is killing that is justified, right? Whether it's militarily or whether I'm, or their state murder or their self-defense. That's a different sermon, but... It's not a simple thing, right? And it requires conversation. It requires community discussion. So rabbis are sitting around the table fighting about points of law, and those points of law ultimately become what we know as rabbinic law. So in Judaism, all things, and if you're going to join the conversation later after, uh, I'm going to, you'll hear this again. All things in Judaism can be answered in one of three ways. Why do we do something? It's either because the Bible said so, because the rabbi said so, or it's a custom. And the custom has weight of law, right? So you're, some of you are going to ask me, why aren't you wearing a yarmulke? So it's not biblical. It's not rabbinic. It's a custom. And you're, oh, every Orthodox Jew is going to be wearing a yarmulke, but I'm not an Orthodox Jew. I'm a Reform rabbi, right? Why do you do Passover? Well, that's biblical, that's rabbinic, and it's custom. Well, what about Hanukkah? Hanukkah's not in the Bible. It's a rabbinic with custom. So that, that's the answer. The idea that we make a fence around the Torah means that the rabbis are taking biblical conversations, expanding them. For example, this is one tiny example, and then we're going to get into the main text. Uh, do not boil a calf in its mother's milk. Gross. But it, 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 it occurs quite often in the biblical text. Clearly there was some disgust of that practice by other cultures, and so the Torah made it clear, don't do it. It's the rabbinic conversation, the fence around the Torah, that community conversation that expands it into never mixing meat and milk. And then, therefore, separate dishes and no cheeseburgers, right? That's the punchline. But, but 
I'm just using that as one example. So I'm just, that's an expansion of Jewish law, but it comes from this conversation. Again, the rabbis are claiming that upon themselves. So what I'm going to share with you today is the classic text of uh, rabbinic claiming of text. It's so good. And, it's, and if you don't know this word already, this is the one word I want you to leave with today. It's a Hebrew word called chutzpah. <laughs> if you've never heard the word before, it means, I'm going to do it nicely because of where I am, gutsiness, right? With, with guts, right? A little bit of brashness. All right. So this is my picture that I pulled from online, which I love. I always imagine like this, rabbis are sitting around having this fight. And the name of this story is called the Oven of Achnai. I want to be very clear. I don't care about the Oven of Achnai. That's not the point of the story. All you need to know is that one of those rabbis there is fighting with the other rabbis. That's all you need to know. And I'm going to show you, the next slide is going to be a lot of text. Don't worry, I'm not reading it. I'm just going to show you the bottom line of it. One of those rabbis is fighting. And I'm going to give you a, 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 cheat, a cheat code. If you're ever reading a piece of Talmud text or a conversation of Jewish law, and the, there's a phrase, the sages say, or the rabbis say, they're right. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter how many people are in the conversation. When they say, the sages, plural, say, it doesn't matter. They're always going to win. So it's almost why even have the conversation, but that's what, that's what we're going to experience. All right? So again, don't, I don't worry about this long text coming up here, but there's this conversation about a, a clay oven and whether or not shards from a previously broken oven can be used to re be recycled into an oven. Weird, right? No one, I, no one cares about this thing. I've just, it had to do probably with whether that previous oven was kosher or not, and whether one rabbi says, yes, you can use those shards again. Again, I don't care that that's his answer. The rabbis collectively say, no, you can't. That's all you need to know, that there's a disagreement between one rabbi and the rest of the rabbis over this oven question and that bottom line. But the rabbis didn't accept Rabbi Eliezer's point of view. Everybody follow me so far? Any questions? Because now we're getting ready to hear the fight. That's, this is the text. Okay, after failing to convince the rabbis logically, and let me tell you why some are in bold and some are in non-bold. The bold is actually translated text from the Talmud. The non-bold is editorial help to get us, otherwise it just says, said to them, right? So, okay, after failing to convince the rabbis logically, Rabbi Eliezer, the one rabbi who was, had one point of view on Jewish law, he says, if the halakha, which is Hebrew for Jewish law, if the law about this particular thing is according to me, if I'm right, this carob tree will prove it. That's a weird flex. The carob tree was uprooted from its place 100 cubits some say 400 cubits. By the way, 100, 400, this thing moved, right? That tree just went up. Now, by the way, special for you, you Plano, I personally, and I'm the only one that has this, I was able to get some video from a museum in Jerusalem. There's actually video footage of this happening. Look at this, right there. All right. Thank you, Google, right? I gotta stop, that's so silly. Okay. The fact that a carob tree moved, that you have to kind of read it tongue in cheek that this tree moved 100 and then over here they're fighting, was it 100 cubits? What's up? Who cares? A tree went and walked and replanted itself. Why did the tree do that? To prove that Eliezer was right on this point of law. <laughs> now, if you're the rabbi in the room, if you're in that room and you saw that carob tree, what would your response be? Okay, all right, we just upended nature to prove Rabbi Eliezer right. It's time to give him his due. But the rabbi said to him, you don't get to prove Jewish legal points from a carob tree. In other words, meh. That's very problematic, right? You really upset Rabbi Eliezer now. I just upended nature to prove that I was right on this point of law. The carob tree agreed with me and you're not listening? Next trick. Eliezer's mad. He says, look, if I'm right, if the halakha, Jewish law is according to me, this stream of water will prove it. So the stream running, let's say, north to south, goes backwards and begins flowing the opposite direction. Again, uh, uh, upending nature and proving it. What's the rabbi's response? Meh. Right? You don't get to prove things from a, a stream of water. Well, now you really made Eliezer mad. Okay? So now we're going to go to trick number three. And he's just trying to prove that he's right. And why don't you all agree with me? This is when it gets good. He says, if the Jewish law is in accordance with me, the walls of this house of study, the room that we're in, 
will prove it. And the walls of the study hall leaned inward and began to fall. And by the way, special for you, you Plano, I happen to be the only one with video footage of this thing happening right there. All right. Okay, the, the walls fall inward, which is a, a key moment in this drama. Um, the walls start to fall inward because, and we're gonna talk about why, why later, it's gonna make sense in a moment, but we finally meet our he new hero, Rabbi Joshua. So Rabbi Joshua stands up, and I love this picture that I found online of him like, you know, shaking his fist. And he says to the walls, he yells at the walls, he says, look, if we, Torah scholars, if we're talking with each other about matters of Jewish law, what's your business in this dispute? But out, walls. <laughs> it's an amazing moment, right? <laughs> and by the way, it's even more amazing what happens. The, the text says the walls then didn't fall out of deference to Rabbi Joshua, but they didn't go back up right either out of deference to Eliezer, and they still remain like this to this day. We're going to come back to that imagery because it's critical a little bit later. You've, at this point, we've really made Eliezer mad. I'm so right on this stupid point of law about a pot shard and an oven, and you all aren't listening to me. I had a carob tree prove it, you didn't listen. I had water prove it, you didn't listen. I conjured the walls to fall in, and Rabbi Joshua stopped them, and you didn't listen. Time to bring out the big guns. And this is where it gets good. He says, if I'm right with this point, heaven will prove it. God's gonna tell you all that I'm right. And guess what? And this is the rabbis writing this. In the Talmud, they say, a bat kol, a divine voice. It's an amazing phrase, but it means like the voice of God. Comes from heaven and says, why are you fighting with Rabbi Eliezer? As the Jewish law is in accordance with him every time he says what an opinion. <laughs> so let's just imagine for a moment, right? That we, we reanimate, I don't know, Thomas Jefferson or George Washington and who gets to come back and tell us exactly what they meant by this amendment or this particular point. Of, and then you're like, shh, right? Like, what do you do when the author comes and interferes at this point? That's an amazing moment. And at this point, game over. Eliezer has proven it through upending nature twice, through the walls. And now God even comes in and says, look, Eliezer's right. And this is where Rabbi Joshua gets involved again. It's a little complicated. It's a good answer, but it's a little complicated. So stay with me. He stands up, same picture, and he says, lo bashamayim hi, one of the great phrases in Judaism, it is not in heaven. And he's quoting, by the way, a text from the Torah, from Deuteronomy. The Torah's five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, he's quoting back to God this. So I wanna, we're gonna do like a little side slide here, and I'm gonna just show you, it's not that important, you get the point, but the slide is, uh, if, if you open up the Torah, the late Deuteronomy, it says, surely this instruction, this law that I'm giving to you, it says in the Torah, it's, that I'm giving you this day, it's not too difficult or baffling to do, it's not beyond reach, it's not in the heavens, it's Loba Shemaimi, that one person would have to say, who among us is gonna go up to the heavens and get the law for us and bring it down that we can observe? Look, it's also not across the sea that you should say who's gonna go across the sea and get it and come back to us. No, 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 it says this thing is close to you. It's in your mouth, it's in your heart to observe. And by the way, this is a vast change in attitude from let's say Leviticus where chop open goats, right? It, where, it, where Judaism was about ritualism and about sacrificial cult worship to the deity, right? This is about your feelings and your heart and your personal capacity and behavior to do righteous deeds. Deuteronomy and Leviticus are on opposite sides of the biblical spectrum. But Rabbi Joshua yells at God this quote and just says, hey, um, it says in your own text that you gave to us at Sinai that the Torah is not there. Hopefully you see where this is going. And then he does a second one. Uh, the text then says, what is it? What's the relevance of that phrase, it's not in heaven? So a different rabbi comes along and says, look, since the Torah was already given at Sinai, we do not regard a divine voice. We don't listen to God. As you, because you already wrote in Sinai, after majority one must incline. I'm going to jump around for a second. Um, the reference here, it's from Exodus 23.2, bottom line. You shall neither side with the mighty to do wrong. Bottom line is, Rabbi Jeremiah here is quoting also Torah, quoting Exodus, basically saying, as we set up courts of justice and as we set up our community, we have to go by majority rule. 
I'm gonna go back a slide. Do you all remember, hope some of you may remember many years ago, there was a, an author, Robert Fulgham, and there was a book that he wrote and it became a poster called Everything I Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Share, take naps, that kind of stuff, right? God, you don't get to get involved because everything you ever needed to tell us, you already told us. He told us at Sinai. You don't need to get involved anymore. Number one, we work on majority rule. <laughs> so, so Rabbi Eliezer can never be right um, because the sages plural have to be right. And number two, that's not where the Torah is. The Torah is right here at this table. This is chutzpah, by the way, if you don't know what, what right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's go back to that imagery of the walls. What would happen if Eliezer was right? Let the walls of this house of study prove it. The walls start to fall inward. Now imagine Joshua did not intervene. What would have happened? Just play it out, right? And who would it have crushed and killed? All the people in that room, which is who? All the rabbis of that day having this conversation. What would have happened if Rabbi Joshua was right and it followed through? The rabbinic project would have ended. There would be no rabbinic Judaism. In fact, like Judaism would have ended because it would have killed all of the people in the room who were building it. So Joshua intervenes and it doesn't write itself because, which tells you that it's a tenuous project. Right? Those slanted walls are not an accident. They actually are a reminder that at any time, if you, the Jewish community, think that you think you should have a pope, uh, one person who gets to rule over the, the masses with a decree, it, it ends. Right? Judaism moving forward, post-70, the rabbinic project is lowercase d democratic, it's majority rule, it's spiritual, it's intellectual, it's conversational, it's study-based. That is rabbinic Judaism. That All Judaism today is rabbinic Judaism, just get rid of the word rabbinic. All Judaism today is based in the rabbinic model. And even when Eliezer came along to kind of upend that or bring up the, hey, I'm right over all the plural, wrong. Okay, so this picture will make sense in a second. It's kind of an amazing moment, but it gets more amazing with one more, with one more postscript. It's an amazing moment because we have watched the rabbis claim for themselves, as they did in that first text, Moses to Joshua to elders to prophets to us. They say, and by the way, what's our job? We don't listen even to God. God doesn't even get to come down and tell us what to do because lo bashamayim, the Torah is not in heaven. God told us everything at Sinai. We have the blueprint. It's important for us to make our decisions based on what is right for our community and what is right based on the information that we have available. Rabbinic Judaism, rabbinic law, Jewish law, Jewish civilization will be progressive and organic. The past, now this is a reform rabbi talking, the past can have a vote, but not a veto. Right? So I'm going to take a little sidestep here and then it's going to connect back. I don't normally spend a lot of time on this slide, but if you know there's a character in the biblical text, the prophet named Elijah. In the text, Elijah is carried off to heaven in a fiery chariot. That's the language they use. It never says the words, he died. And therefore, since Elijah never died, Elijah is a fun literary figure that the rabbis get to use, uh, where they get to say, uh, Elijah's kind of always around, right? The rabbis are wondering something like, you know, what's better, chocolate or vanilla? Oh, let's go ask Elijah, because Elijah is always there. And Elijah then has access to the heavens and the angels and God, and then Elijah has access to us human beings. So Elijah is a fun little literary device that the rabbis use. If they want to know what's going on in heaven, they'll check in with Elijah. Okay? So that's why he pops up in the next slide. So much later after this story, where the rabbis are fighting with Rabbi Eliezer, and Rabbi Joshua tells the voice of God to butt out of conversation. Rabbi Nathan, a different rabbi much later, asks this question. It's really a beautiful text. Years later, Rabbi Nathan encountered Elijah and says to him, hey, what did God, the Holy One, blessed be God, what did God do at that time? What, what, what was God's response when this event happened, when Rabbi Joshua issued his declaration? One of the most beautiful lines in all Talmud. Elijah said to him, God smiled and said, Nitzchoni banai, Nitzchoni banai, in the Aramaic. My children have defeated me. My children have triumphed over me. I just want to let that sit. It isn't enough that they had the chutzpah to tell God to butt out. But now they actually put in God's mouth 
<laughs> that God was laughingly supportive of this. Let me give some context. My daughter, the one who said, you know, hey, Lila, I told you you couldn't have cookies. And you're, I see you're eating cookies. She says, no, no, no. You said I couldn't have cookie. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's a cute little response, right? So what do I do as a dad? I go, you got me. Right? I pick my battles. That's kind of what God does here. God laughs. So I love the idea that God laughs and smiles and says, okay, they got me. They used my own Torah text against me to say the Torah is not in heaven. You win this round. And therefore gives it the approval, divine approval. Even having been yelled at gives divine approval for this project. That's the text that I want to share with this morning. I just want to do like maybe a one minute recap and then we can talk about this much later uh, in, the, in the session. Again, this was a deep dive. This usually is like session number seven or eight, right? To get to this, because I had to teach about Talmud and understand what mission is. I'm using all these terms. All you need to know is this. Judaism is organic and developmental. The biggest mistake that people make who do not know much about Jews, especially modern Jews, is that they think we are biblical Jews. We're not. Right? One of my favorite stories at my temple, we have a lot of church groups that visit and they come to services on Friday night and then they go to, we have some food afterward and then the group comes back into the sanctuary and then we do what's called the Neil show, right? I get to, well, this is a sanctuary and you all saw the service and this is a Torah ark and blah, 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 right? And then I bring out a Torah scroll, it's fun. And then it's the Q&A. The Q&A is the best part. And one year I had this 12-year-old kid from a Methodist church uh, point to the window. We have these stained glass windows and it just so happens our building was built around 1990, the one we're in. And it's one of the ones with uh, floor vents. Remember, you know, you all nicely have air vents from the top. This was stupidly built with floor vents. So anyway, so there are these grates on the floor. And so this kid points to the grate and he says, here, I got a question. Is that where the blood drains out for the sacrifice? <laughs> and by the way, we all laughed like you did here. And I just said, what an amazing question. Of course you think that that's what we do because you just read it in Leviticus. Why would you? Did, how, why would he know what happened in 70? Why would he know there was a temple Judaism that's gone? Why would he know that there was a rabbinic revolution that, over, that took its place? Why would he know that Judaism is not biblical Judaism? He wouldn't. So it's a, it's a, it was a very sweet and, and innocent question, but it, re, it was a reminder to all of us that if I have the chance to teach any community that modern Judaism gets its, its energy from the rabbinic project, this is an example. This is probably the key text to share that. So all Jews, Orthodox, Reform, Conservative, we all operate from this idea that we have to build Jewish community where we are with conversation, with discussion, and um, we don't always agree with one another. We don't allow hierarchy in Judaism, and it's a very progressive and organic and democratic project. And that's really why there's so much pluralism in modern Judaism, because you've got, you know, shades of all the different shades of Judaism, even within the denominations, uh, because we don't have a, a set dogma that we have to agree with. There are things that you can't bring into Judaism for sure, but within the bounds of Judaism, there's a great amount of discussion about law and its application. And even if God wants to get involved, you've got, you can point back to God and say, you don't get to get involved. The Torah is not in heaven anymore. It's right here. It's our job. With that, I'll end and say thank you for letting me share these, this message today.